Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for not being able to speak Slovak, uh, but I think otherwise Maxim would be such a horrible experience to you and you wouldn't appreciate. So I try to do my very best to put everything here in useful English and try to explain why social justice is not just. Social justice is a topic that is, well, giving me company for almost 30 years. I remember stumbling into a class of my then teacher and uh, being in those days, as most students were well, lefty, not very thinking, lots of these terms and ideas, and thought, well, he will tell me how social justice has to be to put, put more concrete terms, but then to my Surprise, he told me that social justice is not a very useful term, and that went back to the idea of British R. von Hayek, who was mentioned already by Peter Wonder. And again, from time to time, I always come back to the topic, being interested if new research in the field might have discovered something that was not seen by Hayek. In fact, that's the case, but uh, still, the answer is to the negative, that social justice is not just. And I try to give the reasons for these answers. As you know, I wear different hats, as many people do. They have been already presented. And my first thanks goes to you for inviting me here to Bratislava and giving me the chance to talk on that subject. Let me give you a brief that you will have an idea what this guy here in front of you is going to talk about so that you can, after one or two minutes, decide whether you will stay inside or go to a better place. So this is what I try to do. First of all, I would like to talk about what I call the compatibility problem. Because when we say that social justice, or if I claim social justice is not just, I must say something about the compatibility of two concepts, namely justice and social justice, and explain why one does not go in hand with the other. One could, of course, say that social justice is not intending to be just, but that would be something different than most or all social justice and redistributionists claim to me. They claim that justice, ordinary such justice, usually is a good thing, but in addition to that, you have to add something to make it even socially just. And let us see whether they succeed or not. So the compatibility problem is our main problem here, in particular if we look at the four options we can, or at least which I selected for this lecture today. One is that we can put a very soft or very unreflected way of social justice that simply claims that redistribution is necessary in order to do something just. And this is what Anthony Blue called unjustified redistribution will be our first version of social justice. Then there is the next one to which British August von Hayek referred when saying that those who claim that the market is socially unjust they simply mix up different spheres. And we need to put this right in order to show that the claim that the market is unjust is not just. <coughs> and then there is perhaps the most well-known theory included in their third category, which I call complementary justice, namely the idea that justice, broad by and large, is a useful concept, but it needs some complement to it, something that in addition to it makes it in full just, and that is social justice as we know it from John Rawls. But there is another version existing apart from Rawls, and these people claim that social justice is in a way limiting justice. Justice does work, but there are particular cases, and some conditions make these cases, which need some limitations to justice, and these make social justice. And finally, some version which does not exist but needs to be mentioned in order to be complete is the finders keepers principle and the idea that is related to it, namely that the original appropriation, something to which we come later, and we will explain later, does call for correction. 
for some reasons and needs to be explained why these reasons do not hold. So these are the five ways in which we are heading. And to start with, let us uh, concentrate on the idea that conceiving social justice as complement to justice without prefix does not work. And for what reason? It is based on the assumption that a more comprehensive notion of justice is necessary for achieving a more just world. Justice is fine, but without a prefix, that does not work. Justice without adjective or prefix. What does that mean? It does mean, first of all, that if we do not look at distributive, social, or otherwise named adjective uh, justice, that each should get what he, inverted commas, deserves, what is deputed to him, each to his own, sum quicker, as the Romans had it, is the idea that has a certain Greek tradition to which we will come particular the Aristotelian tradition which needs to be explored. Aristotle had the concept of justice which was divided, first in a universal sense and then secondly into a particular sense. Justice in a universal sense was taken in a way from Plato but refined and uh, changed at a few uh, edges the idea, namely, that justice in a universal sense simply means the virtuous life, conformity to law. If you look what are the different virtues that you can uh, expose in your life, courage being among them, don't be foolhardy, don't be a coward, be in between, be a courageous person. If in all other respects you prove to be a virtuous man, then you are just in a universal sense. That has nothing to do with the justice in a particular sense, which in itself has to be subdivided into different forms or categories of justice. One being commutative, commutative or rectificatory justice, and the other one distributive justice. Distributive justice, the name might ring a bell because it sounds so much like redistributive justice, but it's not the same as we will see in a second. These two versions now, commutative and, commutative and distributive justice, are important for our uh, next couple of minutes. The commutative or rectificatory justice is to preserve or restitute the legitimate status. Given you have legitimate status for who owns what, then you can see whether the status is kept, and in case it is not, you have to restitute it. The main purpose, of course, to preserve it, well, things happen, burglars are around, thieves. So from time to time it's necessary to restitute the legitimate status. The job of distributive justice is a completely different one. In case of collective gains, because of the war that you made in the booty, then you have to give something to those who participated in war. And you give them following Aristotle according to their merit and not simply according to different criteria. So merit is the keystone and the main criterion for distributing collective gains including honor. So you can make a debate whether these two go along without any clashes. Mainly the concept of Aristotle was to have commutative justice and distributive justice as complementary concepts, so that one sphere does not interfere into the other one. They could go together along with each other. Now, can we say that merit-based justice is social justice? Can we simply copy that from Aristotle and say, well, since he used the term distributive justice, at least that's translation into English, isn't that the same as people use think of when they talk of social justice today. The question is here whether distributive justice is something different than social justice or not. It's not the same. Worthiness based on merits is something different than worthiness based <coughs> on neediness or other criteria. So distributive justice is 
a complement to commutative justice. But can social justice, is it not, if it's not distributive justice, be also be a complement to commutative justice? And if you follow the analysis of Anthony Flew, that's not possible. Under the heading justice and unjustified redistribution, we can say redistribution can be possible and it can be used in order to change the market results. But if so, then we have the following consequence. We have the consequence that social justice, redistribution done in the name of social justice, contradicts commutative justice because it has the following implication. It takes away from A what he does not unjustly possess in order to give it to B who was not unjustly deprived of it. But exactly the reverse is what commutative justice is doing. It takes away from A if he unjustly possesses the thing and gives it to B in case he was unjustly so he was unjustly deprived of it. But if that's not the case, then distributive justice here, social justice, is doing something that clashes with commutative justice. So that does not work. Does the second version perhaps work? <coughs> Namely, we claim that the market has particular results and although each individual acts in accordance with justice, this overall result is, for whatever reason, not just. And if so, if it's not just, then we have to do something in order to revert it into a just state. And here the criticism of British August von Hayek comes in, who had an assumption by making his criticism. The assumption is, of course, if market results are unjust, they ask for correction. So the main question is, are they unjust? And here his answer is, no, it's not the case. And those who claim it, they simply mix the spheres. What does he mean by that? First, following the tradition in the Austrian School of Economics, he would say, if we are talking of units that are acting, we are talking of individuals. Collectives cannot act. Just in a metaphorical way, we can say a group does act. A group of people, even a very small group, they are perhaps by contract in a way related to each other. Everybody knows what he's doing, and so later you can trace it back to his deeds, and you can say, aha, individual A did that, individual B that. So all in that small group, they have their own acts, and they can be put under consideration and could be judged being just or unjust. So if we talk of actions, we can say only individuals act, and only if they can act, then they can either justly act or unjustly. But in order to do so, two qualifications seem to be useful to make. First, they act justly or unjustly only if they intend and sufficiently cause the result. If you intend something, and you sufficiently cause it, then it does make sense to say that whatever you have done can be judged either just or unjust. <coughs> but if you neither intended it, nor were sufficient reason to produce the result, then it does not make sense. The point is that the market is not an individual. The market is not an actor, and its results originate unintentionally from endless market interactions by individuals. So all market participants, all people in this room and everybody else, billions of people around the world, they from day to day do thousands of market transactions, millions of market transactions, and they have their own ideas and own uh, goals they are pursuing. But the overall result is not depending on the individual. So it does not make sense to call the overall result just or unjust. Simply mixing of spheres does not make sense to talk about the results in terms of justice or unjustice. 
this than the result. The results of the market are neither socially just nor socially unjust. That is not to say that the individual actions are just or unjust. This is a different matter, but the market results are not socially just or unjust. Now, if that is the case, can we look at social justice from a different perspective? Or is all that criticism put forward here by Anthony Flew and British August von Hayek sufficient in order to make all other <coughs> attempts useless? Well, one could ask oneself, is it possible to call for social justice without claiming the market was socially unjust? And without claiming that social justice is the same as distributive justice in Aristotelian terms. As we will see, this is possible. And here we have two different versions. Now I use social justice as an acronym, it has nothing to do with societas ISO, so this is different crew. Uh, social justice meant as complementary justice said in the beginning, what does that mean? Now we can put an assumption. Under certain conditions we can claim that the market actors would prefer a different distribution of market results, given everybody would for some reason not be happy with the outcome of the market, even the winners. Then of course they would say, well let's go for a different outcome or redistribution. It's like playing cards or another game. If you're not happy with the rules, you can change the rules. If you do that unanimously, what's the problem? You do that in your using your freedom. So a liberal could not object to that. So the assumption is conceivable, it's possible that we don't know yet on which conditions, but at least we can think of that it might be possible that under certain conditions people would prefer a different distribution of market results. Without that assumption, say, without that assumption being possible, it wouldn't make sense to look for complementary conception of justice. But there is another option, apart from the first one, namely that social justice is a kind of limiting formal or ordinary justice. And here the assumption is a different one. One would say that under certain conditions, commutative justice leads to injustice only under certain conditions, not in every case, but it might be that for some reason or another, we have to look into those reasons, it does lead to injustice. Now, the first of these last two versions <coughs> is linked to a man, you can see him here, John Rawls, who is well known and his idea of social justice is the most debated one up to today. And he has a kind of set of particular assumptions which I would like to put under this heading here or into that small sentence. And I'm well aware that doing justice to someone who has been debated for <coughs> millions of all of this uh, is probably very problematic, but what I, my intentions were, were to put him in a way that you can make a good argument for him. So it does not make sense to say that in a book such and such he made formulation which does not make sense at all. That is not very useful. Try to make someone as strong as possible in his own framework and then criticize him. That I think is a much better uh, idea. So there are three elements which are very important to him. First, the veil of ignorance. Under the veil of ignorance and following the maximum rule, second thing, people would prefer redistribution that matches the difference principle, third thing. So we have these three elements which are important. For those who don't know, the veil of ignorance is the idea that people would take different decisions if they would not know what their fate is. And of course we don't know, but this is part of the debate. We have at least some idea in which way we might go in the future. But of course there is an uncertainty. He's not saying uncertainty, that's something that put, was put into debate by James Buchanan. He's using the term veil of ignorance. But leave it for the moment and don't uh, make that more complicated. But this is the assumption, or one of the assumptions. And the another one mentioned is 
that under that veil of ignorance, people would follow the maximum rule. The maximum rule can be described as follows. Although we try to do our very best in order to have a better life, it might be that we fail, or simply because we were not lucky, do not have the fortune we were expecting. Even if we were born in a rich family, it might be that we ruined the entire world of the family that was put together years and ages before. It's risky, probably right. And then the difference principle. The difference principle says, given that we have circumstances, which I'm going to describe in a second, that call for distribution, we do not distribute voluntarily or arbitrarily, but we distribute from those who are the least fortunate to those, sorry, to those who are the least fortunate, and take it from those who had better situations. The idea is, it might be, and that is, at least sounds very commonsensical, if you run the risk that you might completely, completely broke after some while, that might, might be helpful then if you would be protected by some redistribution. It's like the insurance system, that is the reason why we have insurances, because we might run into a misfortune. Then the insurance premium would pay off and we would not be completely broke down. As I said, I don't want to go through the three principles or main thoughts in his justice theory, but they are important and we'll find them back. What I try now is, as I said, it does not make sense to blame someone for being weak at some point in his career, but try to make him as strong as possible. Here with the help of Pareto and Popper, Pareto the first year, and Popper the last one. Alfredo Pareto, or Wilfredo as some called him, had an idea which we know is quite a common one, the Pareto optimality and a few principles related to it, can be put in various ways. One way of putting it, which is important here, is that we can say if one or more superior alternatives to A exist, then it is not rational to insist on A. That's very simple. If you have different scenarios, that's the status quo, and all other scenarios, or at least one of them, is such that in every respect, it's not worse than the status quo, but at least in one better. Why should you stay with the status quo? You would gain something. That does so if you are an individual and does hold for everybody in the group. So even if a group would face that option, that nobody would be worse off, or someone would be better off, it wouldn't make sense to stick with the status quo. This is not to say that it would make sense to change immediately to the other option. So we are stepping, we should not step too uh, fast ahead. But it's clear it's not rational to stick with the situation which was not as good as the superior alternative. As I said, this does not say which of the superior alternatives should be shown. Should there be several of them, sometimes you have just one, sometimes you might have different ones, and then you simply do not know, not know yet. But uh, you have a set from which you can choose namely superior alternatives. <coughs> now Karl Popper has some, said something which is quite useful, and that refers, into, or refers to other areas as well, but here, applied to that problem, one can say, for logical reasons, it is impossible to exclude the possibility that a superior alternative to A could exist. That is something which can be held against those who say, well, look at the market. The market is the best possible solution. There is no way to have a better solution for a group of people. So we do not have to look for a Pareto optimal solution. Then, of course, you cannot go the way and investigate whether social justice can be found on that track. But going back to Popper and his observation, that's true, it's possible that it exists. We don't know whether it does exist, but it's possible, and so it's worthwhile to see where or if at all it does exist. Now let's try to have an interim conclusion to you know where we are. My goodness, we go ahead and ahead, where we are in the end. We can say one or more alternatives, all of them superior to market results, 
could possibly exist. That is what we can say with the help of Pareto and Potter. If at least one, in fact, exists, then it is not rational to insist on market results. That would be, so to speak, the application to the best roles in framework, not Kim. Uh, at least I can think of. And if more than one superior alternative exists, then redistribution should be in favor of the worst off, following the maximum rule and the difference principle. That is what he is proposing, roles, in case we have various options. Then his recommendation would be aha, uh -huh, for the reasons mentioned before. So in the original state, you would decide under the male reference and be aware of the maximum rule. So it's better to give to those who are the worst off in the game or have expectations, should be expected to be the worst off in the game. <coughs> then putting that together, we have, in a way, a short version. Thankfully or gratefully, John Rawls himself had a formulation in one of his writings that puts these ideas together, the maximum rule and the difference principle. Now, quoting him, he says thus, in comparing different arrangements of the social system, we can say that one is better than another if in one arrangement all expectations are at least as high and some higher than in the other. The principle gives grounds for reform, for it is there, sorry, for it there is an arrangement which is optimal in comparison with the existing state of things. Then, other things equal, it is a better situation all around and should be adopted. So that is taken from the book by Peter Lasseter and Walter Rankeman. Going slowly over the lines, you see, aha, uh -huh, it's the idea that if you have, in fact, alternative situations, then choose the one, choose the one which, following the difference principle, does a favor to those who are the worst off. That is what should be adopted. So he's going a step further. It should be done. It's uh, not what you can logically derive, but it's a recommendation that is added to it. Now, so far we have not criticized Rawls. We try to, I try to analyze him and systemize him in a way that uh, his idea of social justice can be pursued further without running into too deep problems of inner contradiction. But there are many different criticisms found in the literature which I should not completely ignore. First of all, the idea of the veil of ignorance is been, has been criticized to be completely unrealistic that people have to build expectations and you cannot do without and even if you are not going to the right direction you still have to in the end that people simply would not take decisions under the veil of ignorance might be replied that that is not the main idea that uh, they should do in reality but it's just a conception but then you have another problem Saying that people could rationally prefer the roles in conception is not enough. They could also prefer a different one. Not giving to the worst of in the end, but giving to another group. And in the end, claiming is not the same as showing is. It does not prove that this is what people would in the end decide what they would prefer. Although it might be conceived to be rational. So that boils down to the main argument, namely that fictitious contracts are not contracts at all. So far, the theory has only provided the idea that these contracts could be agreed upon by everybody. It would not go against rationality of the individuals. That's true. It's not necessarily going against rationality. But you do not have the contract after all. And fictitious contracts are not a subclass of contracts. They are simply no contracts at all. So without real contractual approval by all individuals, Rawlsian redistribution implies an unjustified prioritization of competing utility preferences. What a wonderful term. Unjustified prioritization of competing utility preferences. 
That is what you have to do in literature. If you want to write on a topic, you have to add different terms or to make it look more complicated. But the basic idea behind it is very simple. We know that given that we have to live with scarce resources, people have different utility preferences. If you want an apple, your neighbor wants at the same time, you have different utility preferences and you have to talk about it or try to solve the problem otherwise. But the competition is there and the question is, who should have priority? It's clear when you have a property rule, if people have legitimately acquired something, they dispose about these goods in a justified way. Their prioritization <coughs> is clear. But here, the Rawlsian redistribution implies an unjustified prioritization, namely of those who would benefit from the redistribution, the worst off. And it's not justified. He has not given reasons for it. It's just the assumption that people prefer it, but he has not shown that they, in fact, prefer it. So it does not work. What in the end we have is, out of these four options we started with, we have another one which is not in that elaborate way as the Rawlsian conception and other ones that go in the same direction, with different criteria added to it. But it's, it's reconstructable. And uh, the idea has been called, or I prefer to call it, that social justice has to be understood as a concept that is limiting formal justice. Formal or ordinary justice by and large does work, but it needs from time to time some limitations. And you hear here one of the gentlemen uh, gentleman who could be used for that uh, idea, namely the thesis that market actors use private goods as well as common goods. If that is the case, then we can say Using the latter calls for false. The idea is, as you have it with many common goods, in particular tall goods, or, I don't know, there's so much known in, in all countries, but well, we have it in the US and <coughs> many other countries. For instance, bridges, when you use a bridge, sometimes you have free bridges, sometimes you have to pay, you pay at all in order to cross the bridge. The idea is that that is something that the commune has the Rhine it, and you have to repair the bridge from time to time. So it's fair and proper to ask those who run over the bridge more often than others to pay more. So in relation to the use rate, so to speak. That holds in case you have the following fact, that much of what you use in order to become wealthy, to make market transactions, you use your private goods, those of others, they voluntarily agree, and common goods. If so, using common goods does call for tolls. Now we can say that people like Gerald Feinberg, the gentleman here on the left, or James Griffin and others, have something to add to the idea of social justice, perhaps a new concept. Namely the idea that market actors consume pool goods owned by the common. And in a way we can think of those goods uh, in many ways. We use these goods, one has to say something before, they make pool goods as a broader term and they include some, of, some goods which are clearly not common goods uh, and not pool goods which should be in the same name but that's a mistake that can be uh, uh, taken out and be corrected. But we can think of common goods, for instance the market Language. Hayek himself talked about that very often, that the language is a good, used by people, came out spontaneously, long process of conventions, of evolution, cultural evolution was the main driving force for those rules. We have the same with law, we have market rules, and in fact if you go to a market, uh, it consists of people being there at the same place and offering goods. And you can use it. You can use it as a consumer. You have different competitors. So they compete with each other, making goods more affordable to you. Or you are among those who simply offer goods. And you are lucky because many people come to the fairground in order to buy goods. And that's uh, beneficial to you because you do not have to do your own private marketing. People simply come by. 
Now, in a way, that's right. We use these, let's call them pool goods, to go away from the term common good. Uh, goods that are coming spontaneously across when people interact. If it were right that they were, to put that back to our memory, that these were common goods, then it would be fair and proper to ask people to pay in proportionality to his or her use rate. And we could say socially just redistribution finally serves commutative justice. Commutative justice is not enough. From time to time, as we say, see here, it's necessary to do something to make it completely just. And social justice is nothing as an addendum to it. Now, is that right, that these goods are pool goods? We have criticism here by Anthony de Jose, who was mentioned by Peter before too, who says, well, look at those goods. These goods, pool goods, because that's a term used by Feinberg and Griffin, they are not common goods. They are simply positive externalities, no more nor less. It's like the music by a trumpet player on the street. If he plays, uh, you might enjoy it, other people too. If he does not play it so good, you might not enjoy it. But anyway, it's an externality, and depending on how you value it, it's either positive or negative externality. So a market or language, in most cases, is a positive externality, unless you don't like what people are saying. But it is an externality, and you can value it positively. By doing so, that does not mean that that good is part of everybody so that it is rightfully claimed to be a common good. They are simply free goods. It's like the sun or many other free goods that are around. As long as they are not appropriated individually, they do not belong to everybody. They do not belong to anybody. That's a huge difference. They are simply not in property by any individual person. Because that is so, we cannot say that the total argument holds. It's not solely just to ask for redistribution by our tall. I mean, otherwise one could say, see all these rich people, uh, Bill Gates, what have you, they made their money because they used market transactions so often. So they used the market, the common good market so often. And isn't it fair and proper that we ask them to pay higher taxes because they use that good more than others. No, they use simply a free good, a positive externality. That was free to everybody. Everybody else is free to use it in that amount. It's not owned by the community. On top of that, it's interesting to see that these cool goods are not only <coughs> consumed, they are also provided. They are produced, refreshed, and you realize that from the market that is growing. If more people go to the market, offer more goods, more people come in order to buy goods, then the market is bigger. The competition is fierce, fiercer than before. So it's even better for you as consumers because you get cheaper prices. And it's even better to have more consumers coming to the market in order to see your products you're going to, to sell. So on top of that, we have to see that they're not only consumed, they are produced, and if so, if the logic of the former argument would hold, then we could say that latter, namely the production of public pool goods, implies that redistribution from inland to diligent market actors would more than compensate the reverse redistribution. It would lead, to put it in different terms, simply to the result that we have to pay Bill Gates and all others who make billions of dollars every year because they, by giving their products to the money, create even bigger markets. Obviously, that is not in the spirit of the redistributionists, but that would be the counter-argument if their argument would be valid in the first place, which is not. Now you have gone with me through four different options. Oh my goodness, still something to do. But this is the final one, and luckily, I can say, uh, because it is not explored, not at all. 
But you can make the following argument, given that it's why right what you have said so far, that social justice cannot be constructed in the way you do. Uh, and it is not complementary to justice, then could it be that even that all market transactions that are pursued, <coughs> respecting property and the freedom of others, that in the end, despite the fact that they all were just in themselves, right in the beginning, before market transactions took place, something went wrong. And that's the idea of original appropriation, the first possession idea. Someone started, we know that, and the debate, for instance, in the US, the settlers, the pilgrims, they went over from England and other countries and they settled there. And they took the land, they cultivated it. But we know that the Red Indians lived there before. And so still there is the debate, who really owns that land? So that kind of argument could be made. See, even if you and your grandfather and grand-grand-grandfather, uh, they all uh, did right by their market transactions, at some stage they began. And they began by originally appropriating, and was that, because it's not a market transaction, a just action. That is an open, or say, that is a question that could be, uh, that could be of course asked. And in some historical cases it is. But it's not completely liberated the concept of social justice yet. But let's see whether that argument would hold in case somebody would come up with that idea. I, I still have enough time to do so. Okay. Then here you have the thesis that the chain of accumulation might be just. How about first possession? Let us look at the following. There are two arguments that show that the first possession does not run into problems. And these arguments are a little bit complicated, but they are easy, well, still they are uh, possible to reconstruct. The one is the, what is called the argumentum pro libertate, the argument in favor of freedom. And the other one is an argument which I would call asymmetric claims, to make it short. And here are the two thinkers who are responsible for these arguments. The second is Anthony Jose, the first is Gerhard Anitsky, who I uh, this argument. So they try to show that the first possession or original appropriation situation, following the ideas of the finders keepers principle, does not run into problems of injustice. For what reasons? First of all, that's the argument from Libertate by Magnitsky. He says, for logical reasons, it is impossible to prove that not justified objection to original appropriation taken in freedom exists. What he's saying by this is simply that, of course, we do not know in each and every case whether the original appropriation was taken in justice. But that's not the problem. It's not the problem because those who claim that it has been done in injustice, they should prove that. And why is it that they have the burden of proof? The reason is, it's logically impossible for you to show that there is no objection at all, conceivable or in reality existing, that speaks against the action that you have taken in freedom and claiming that it has been done in injustice. But it is very easy for the one who is of different opinion to show his reason why what you have done was unjust by originally appropriating a good. So the burden of proof should be with the one who claims that original appropriation was problematic right from the beginning. He simply follows the rule, all it implies can. You should not ask someone to do something he cannot possibly do. So ask him to show that there was never a problem with the original appropriation that was the first step into wealth creation, that is something he cannot deliver. The other argument by Anthony de Jazé is that first possession does not imply any asymmetric claim. What is meant by this? Now, if we look at a typical case where two people come at the very same time at an object, 
which none of them does own. They have competing utility preferences, and the point is whose preference should be prioritized. If they both grab for it, it's a stalemate. You can have a decision. Then, in one way or another, they have to talk about it. But in case you are the only one, early bird picks the worm, you are there and you can take it. There are no competing preferences. There are no competing utility preferences regarding that good. So if you take it, you simply make use of your freedom. Nothing else. Those who come later and say, ah, see, we do not know whether that was just and proper. So we ask for a suspension or for a redistribution. Then hmm, they ask for something that is asymmetric. In the state where you have the early bird and someone who is coming later who wants to have part of it that the early bird picks, he asked the early bird to worsen his situation in comparison to the status quo. Whereas he does not ask that of himself or anybody else. So he has two asymmetric claims. That's the argument of Jose put here, that uh, the demanding suspension of originally appropriated goods implies asymmetric claim, namely a one slightly <coughs> worsening of the original owner. Conclusions, finally. In the end, and that is always what you try to do at the end of a lecture that goes through many problems of philosophy and always being on the abstract level, that's unfortunately our fate as philosophers, we have to deal with that. But in the end, you say, that is what I've shown. So for those who fell asleep in the meantime, they go wake up and say, ah, see, you solve all the problems, at least I can put a positive conclusion and take it back home. So what at least try to show is that the cardinal conceptions of social justice, as shown here, and there's several others, are incompatible with formal justice. And those others that do exist are, to my knowledge, even worse than the ones I reproduced here. So whatever we have seen, <coughs> and can be rated at theory or conception of social justice, is incompatible with formal justice. And that is the reason why we can say that the socially just is not just. This holds for the complementary as well as for the limiting formal justice version of social justice. And what we can say in reverse is that market results based on original appropriation and commutatively just accumulation of wealth are compatible with prefix free or formal justice. That is the difference to compare to the conceptions of social justice. Thanks a lot for listening.